3. Time drifted by, de Grandin going, gun in hand, each night to his lonely vigil. But no developments in the mystery of the Humphreys murder or the attack on Paul Maitland were reported. The date for Millicent Comstock's wedding approached and the big mansion was filled to overflowing with boisterous young folks. Still de Grandin continued to invert the time, sleeping by day, patrolling by night. Two nights before the marriage day he accosted me as he came downstairs. Tropage, my friend, you have been most patient with me. If you will come tonight, I think, perhaps, I can show you some result. All right, I agreed, I haven't the slightest idea what all this fold roll is about, but I'm willing to be convinced. At his request I got out my car and drove to within a block of the Comstock house, parking the machine in a small copse of trees where it would be readily accessible, yet effectually concealed. My friend, de Grandin began as we skirted the Comstock lawn, keeping well hidden in the shadows, I am not certain of what I do. I am like one who walks on familiar paths, with a wink on his eyes, yet my brain tell me I follow no false road. No one knows what Parteni, the moon goddess, plays in the affairs of men, even today, when her name is forgotten by all but the Stidri Antiquaries. This we know, however, at the entrance of life or appearance is governed, in the matter of days, by the face of the moon. You, as a physician with obstetrical knowledge, know that, too, when the time to go approach, the crisis of disease is often governed by the moon's face. Why this is we know not, that it is we know full well. Suppose, then, the cellular organization of a body be violently, unnaturally, chindé, and naturelle soul force be exerted toward a readjustment. Is it not reasonable to suppose that the moon, which affects Shelbert and it, might have some force to apply in such a case? I dare say, I conceded, but I don't follow you. Just what is it you expect, or suspect, de Grandin? Nothing, he answered. I suspect nothing, I affirm nothing, I deny nothing. I am agnostic, but I am hopeful. If events prove me, a dotting fool, making a great, black lutin of my own shadow, no one will be a pair than I. But it who propels for the worst, is most agreeably disappointed if the best occurs. He touched my elbow. Ere we rest a while, he murmured, squatting in the shadow of a small clump of dwarf pines. That light, it is in the window of Mademoiselle Millicent's room, n'est-ce pas? Yes, I confirmed, wondering if I were on a fool's errand with a lunatic for company. The merrymaking inside the house was wearing to a close as we took our station. Within half an hour the mansion was shrouded in quiet darkness. De Grandin fidgeted nervously, fussing with the lock of his gun, ejecting and reinserting cartridges, playing a devil's tattoo on the barrel with his long, tapering fingers. Almost like a floodlight turned on the scene, the moon's radiance suddenly deluged the house, grounds and surroundings with silver as the wind swept aside a veil of clouds. Ah, De Grandin muttered, now we shall see what we shall see, perhaps. As though his words had been a cue, there echoed from the house before us a scream of such wild, bewildered terror as few men have been unfortunate enough to hear. In the course of twenty years active practice of medicine I had heard almost every sort of cry that physical anguish can wring from tortured flesh, but never anything like this. Fear, stark, hideous fear, played on the vocal cords of the screamer like a madman twanging a harp bringing forth a symphony of terror that stopped the breath, hot and sulphurous, in my throat, and sent an itching tingle through my scalp. Ah, 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 de Grandin exclaimed in a rising tone as he grasped his rifle and stared fixedly at the house. Grand Dieu, grand et comme far. Only dead, and I shall be content. Light flashed inside the house. The patter of terrified feet sounded among the babel of wondering, questioning voices, but the scream was not repeated. Ah, ah, de Grandin breathed again, his voice razor-edged with excitement. Look, my friend, Gorille, behold, he comes. 
Emerging from Millicent's window, horrible as a devil from lowest hell, was a great, hairy head set low upon a pair of shoulders which must have been four feet across. An arm which, somehow, reminded me of a giant snake, slipped forth, grasped the cast iron downspout at the corner of the house, and drew a thick set, misshapen body after it. A leg, tipped with a prehensile, hand-like foot, was thrown over the sill, and, like a spider from its lair, the monster leaped from the darkened window and hung a moment to the iron pipe with its sable body silhouetted against the white walls of the house. But what was that, that white-robed form which hung pendant from the grasp of the beast's free arm? My staring eyes strained across the moonlit night and my mouth went dry with horror. Like a beautiful, white moth inert in the grasp of the spider, her fair hair unbound and falling like a golden veil before her marble-white face, her night clothing rent into a motley of tatters. Millicent Comstock hung in the creature's grasp. Shoot, shoot, man, for God's sake, shoot. I screamed, but only a whisper, inaudible ten feet away, came from my fear-thickened lips. Say, ass, fool, de grand in ground between his teeth, as he pressed his gun stock against his cheek and drew the muzzle in line with the descending brute's body. Slowly, so slowly it seemed an hour was consumed in the process, the great primate descended the water pipe leaping the last fifteen feet of the trip and crouching on the moonlit lawn, its tiny, deep-set eyes glaring malignantly, as though it challenged the world for possession of its prey. I could hear de Grandin's breath rasping in his nostrils as he sighted his gun and drew the trigger. A roar like a bursting shell sounded as the smokeless powder's flash burned a gash in the night and a bullet went screaming through the air. Again de Grandin fired, throwing the magazine mechanism with feverish haste. The monster staggered drunkenly against the house as the detonation of the first shot sounded. With the second, it dropped Millicent's body to the lawn and uttered a cry which was part roar, part snarl, and, trailing one of its hairy arms helplessly, leaped toward the woods. Crossing the grass plot in great, awkward leaps which reminded me, absurdly, of the bouncing of a huge inflated ball. At the mademoiselle, de Grandin commanded sharply, throwing a fresh cartridge into his firing chamber. I will see to the airy one. Have no fear, I have shot his brethren in Africa. I bent above the girl's huddled body, putting my ear to her breast. Faint but perceptible, I made out a heartbeat and lifted her in my arms, carrying her toward the house. Dr. Trowbridge. Mrs. Comstock, followed by a throng of frightened, half-clothed guests, met me at the front door. What has happened? Good heavens, Millicent. He rushed forward, seizing her daughter's flaccid hands in both her own trembling ones. Oh, what is it? What is it? Help me get Millicent to bed and get me some smelling salts and some brandy, I commanded, ignoring her questions. A few minutes later, with restoratives applied and electric pads at her feet and back, the girl showed signs of returning consciousness. Get out, all of you, I ordered curtly. Hysterical women, even patients' mothers, are no occupants for the room when consciousness is regained after profound shock. Millicent stirred in her faint, rolling her head feebly from side to side and moaning. Oh, oh, the ape thing, the ape thing. She whimpered in a small, childish voice. It was not till several hours later I realized she used exactly the term Paul Maitland had employed when recovering from his faint. All right, dear, I comforted. It's all right, now. You're safe in bed. Old Dr. Trowbridge is here, he won't let anything hurt you. Half opened her lovely eyes, saw me sitting beside her, and smiled sleepily in reassurance. Next moment she was soundly and naturally asleep, both her hands clasping one of mine. Doctor. Dr. Trowbridge, Mrs. Comstock whispered from the bedroom door. We've searched all over the place, and there's no sign of Mr. Manley. Do, do you suppose anything could have happened to him? I think it quite likely something could, and did, I answered, turning from her to smooth her daughter's hair. A la barbe d'un bouc noir, de Grandin exclaimed as, disheveled, but with a light of exhilaration in his direct blue eyes, he met me in the Comstock Hall some two hours later. Chère Madame Comstock, you are to be congratulated, but for my so brave colleague, Dr. Trowbridge, and my own lowly self, your charming doctor had shared the fate of that never enough to be pitied, Sarah Humphreys. Trowbridge, man view. I have not been quite frank with you, 
I have not told you all but this thing, it was so incredible, so seemingly impossible, that you would not have believed. Even now, knowing what you know, having seen with your two eyes what you have seen this night, you do not quite believe. Eh bien, perhaps it is better so. Begin, when this sacre Benekendorf was in the mad house, he raved continually about his confinement, cheating him of his revenge, the revenge he had so long planned against one, Madame Comstock of America. We French, we are logical, not like you English and Americans. We write down and keep for possible reference, even what a madman say. Why not? It may be useful someday. Now, Front Bridge, I tell you some time ago this Benekendorf were reported in the Congo Belgique. Yes? But I do not tell you he were reported in charge of a young, half grown gorilla. No. When this pauvre Mademoiselle Humphries is killed in that so terrible manner, I remember my own African days, and I say to me, ah, ah. It look as if Monsieur le Gorille, the Gorilla, have been about this place. I ask to know if any such have escaped from a circus or the from nearby or far. Au lancer Arnaud. Then that Sergeant Costello, he bring me to this so splendid savant, Dr. Trowbridge, and with him I go to interview that young Paul Meland, who have encountered much strangeness on the golf links where the young woman was killed. Then that Sergeant Costello, he bring me to this so splendid savant, Dr. Trowbridge, and with him I go to interview that young Paul Meland who have encountered much strangeness on the golf links where the young woman was killed. And what do he tell me? He relate of a thing that have a ear, that jump up and down like an enraged ape, and that act like a gorilla, but where man's evening clot, par bleu, it is. To think, no Gorilla have escaped, yet what seems one is he rencountered, wearing the clothes of a man. I search my memory. I remember that madman, and the poor infants he turned into monkey things, with his damnable serums. I say, if he can turn man children into monkey things, why not can he turn up things into men things? Eh? Hey. I find one Dr. Kalmar. Leave here unknown. I search about, and learn a certain man here are seen coming from his place in secret. I also find in this certain man's discarded shirt the hair of a gorilla. More bleu, I think some more, and the thoughts I think are not pleasant thoughts. I reason, suppose this serum which make a man think of an ape are not permanent? What then? It are not renewed at times, the man become an ape again. You follow? Bien. Now, the other day, I learned something which make me think some more. This Benekendorf, he rave against one Madame Comstock. You, Madame Comstock, admit you once knew this Benekendorf. He have loved you, as he understand love, now he hate you as only a with his diseased, but great brain, can hate. Is it not against you, a plan is the village scheme? I think so. I sound a cablegram, never mind who to. Dr. Trowbridge knows that, and I get the answer I expect, but fear. The man in whose shirt I find those gorilla hair is no man at all, he is one terrible masquerade of a man. So, now, I reason, suppose this masquerading monkey thing do not get his serum as expected, what will he do? I fear to answer my own question, but I do answer it, just the same, and I buy a gun. These gun have bullets of soft lead, and I make them stay more efficient by cutting a v-shaped notch in each of their head. When they strike something, they spread out for a space you could not cover with your hand. Voila. I take my gun and weigh tonight what I have expect come about. I am ready. I shoot and each time my bullet strike, it tear a great hole in the body of the man who is sent up. Drop is spray. And seek the shelter his little ape, bring tell him to fly to. He goes to the house of this so unknown, Dr. Kalmar. I follow quick. The ape are tortured with my bullet wounds. When he reached the house of Kalmar, he is en cri, and set upon this Kalmar and tear him to pieces, even as he have killed poor, Sarah Humphries before. I, 
arriving with my gun, I killed a gorilla with one more shot. But, before I come back here, I recognized a dead corpse of dead Dr. Kalmar. He are one, and the same as dead Benekendorf, who have escaped from our Paris Maddows. I destroy a devil's bruise, with which he make monkeys of men, and men of monkeys. It is better their secret be never known. I think the Mademoiselle Humphries were so unfortunate as to meet this man up when he were on his way to Calmar's house, as he had been talked to come. As man, perhaps, he knew not this Calmar, or, as we know him, Benekendorf, but as brute this Benekendorf was the only man he know, his master, the man who brought him from Africa. When he find that poor girl, she scream, and his savageness become hypermost, believe me, the gorilla is ten to some times, more savage than the lion, and a terror to pieces. He also try to tear the young melon to pieces, but, luckily for him and for us, he fell, and we get the story which put us on the track. Voila, it is finished. Triumph. I make my report to the good Sergeant Costello, and show him the body at Kalmar House. Then I return to France. The Ministry of Health, they will be glad to know that Benekendorf is no more. But, Monsieur de Grandin, Mrs. Comstock demanded, Who is this man, or this ape, you killed? I held my breath as de Grandin fixed his direct stare on her, then sighed with relief as he replied, I cannot say, Madame. Well, Mrs. Comstock's natural disputatiousness came to the surface. I think it's very queer you know so much about him, but don't know his name. Ah, madame, he shook his head sadly. There are very many queer things in life, things which may puzzle even you. I bid you good night. When the police look for Monsieur Manly, mon dieu, what an name for an ep thing. They will be puzzled, he told me as we walked toward my waiting motor. I must remember to warn Sergeant Costello to ante that disappearance on his books as a case permanently unsolved. No one will ever know the true facts but you, I and the French Ministry of Health, Trowbridge, my friend. The public, they would not believe, even if we told them. I wonder if they will. This will conclude with this episode, The Horror on the Links, by C. Berry Quinn. Please help this project to continue providing more stories, by following, subscribing and sharing. Until the next story, thank you from, Campfire and Fables.